thanks a lot for joining us. Mr. Israel, please tell us a bit about yourself and uh, how you're helping repair shops in today's climate. Yeah, so basically I started a repair shop back in 2012 and uh, I started in Memphis, Tennessee. It was a very fun moment uh, for shops to, to get started at that point, I think. There was a lot of uh, uncertainty about parts, about how the industry really worked. Um, I remember that before I opened my repair shop, I was an engineering master's student at the University of Memphis. And uh, I used to repair phones off Craigslist. It kind of started as an accident. Um, one of my friends needed a phone repair and I was like, hey, uh, you know, I can do this. If you want to buy the parts and the tools, um, I'll keep the tools and then, you know, I'll do it basically for that, you know, for that. And uh, it was a very fun uh, little project that I had. And I was like, you know, after this, I was like, let me look into this and see how much, you know, people usually charge for this. And uh, what I found out, it was that there was uh, basically two repair shops in town and they were, you know, fairly expensive and they were taking two to three days. And I was like, I think this can be improved, you know? Um, so I started, uh, my first business I started when I was out of high school, I had a tutoring center and uh, in Mexico. So, you know, my, my entrepreneurship spirit kicked in and I was like, um, let me let me do a little more research on this, right? So uh, the, the, the next thing was a little more of a, like, a broader sample. And I was like, all right, let me see. Uh, I'm gonna get more parts in stock and I'm gonna charge this. And I wanna put ads on Craigslist because it was free, right? I was fairly broke. <laughs> I was a uh, university student living in the US uh, with not much savings. Um, and uh, it, it was a little, uh, just very surprising the amount of people that were reaching out. Um, and I started doing repairs on the weekends. And I mean, I was literally, you know, having people come over to my apartment from seven in the morning to 10 at night. <laughs> it started taking a little bit, you know, of a toll basically uh, throughout the weekends. And then I was like, well, people keep, reaching out so i guess i want to have to do it in the afternoon so it started taking you know more time and so forth until i was like man i this is fun but i think i need to finish my degree so <laughs> let me find a uh, a repair shop uh, or a, a place you know uh in town and obviously you know when you're trying to open a business you always want the best right so i uh, uh there was there's an avenue on, on in memphis called poplar avenue and uh, I had done some work for a real estate agent, a yeah, commercial real estate agent. And I basically emailed him and I was like, hey man, look, I know this is pretty much impossible, but uh, if you can find me a spot on Poplar Avenue between this, avenue, between this street and this street for less than a thousand dollars, you know, give me a call. And uh, I would check my email every day and uh, nothing, nothing, you know, after three weeks, I, I kind of had lost hope. And then I got an email and it was from him. And I was like, well, let me read it, right? It was fairly long uh, when I first glanced at it and it started like, man, what you're asking is fairly impossible, you know? <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, I was kind of reading and thinking, yeah, yeah, you're right, you know, it is. And then at the end I was like, but there's one spot that opened up <laughs> if you want to look at it. And I think this was like a Monday and by like Wednesday, I was signing the lease. And uh, one of the things that I've always said is Mr. Graver is the name of, it's is the landlord. And I'm so thankful because there's no way I would have rented to myself <laughs> looking back, you know, <laughs> a, master's, a, a master's student uh, working for the university, not making a lot of money, um, you know, had a shot for this like prime real estate uh, in Memphis. So you know, that's kind of how it started. Then I moved into, uh, quickly, I think, you know, I realized uh, I really wanted to have certain aspects, certain look of the repair shop, right? Uh, I wanted not to look like I was a broke uh, college student. I wanted to look like, you know, it was a place where people can, you know, stop and get something repaired. Um, and uh, it quickly evolved to where I was kind of like, 
looking at designs and making sure that the, the, the feel of the shop uh, was a very comfortable feel, right? And I was always striving to look like a franchise. That, that's kind of like something that I had in my mind, right? I was like, man, I need to look like a franchise. I need to look like a franchise. And I remember I like printed several things and I like kept taking, like ripping it off, putting it back in, on and, you know, kind of making improvements and so forth week after week, painting it, you know, everything you can imagine in order for it to like look like a shop. Um, <clears throat> and I remember like one of the like first times when uh, someone walked in and he's like, man, this is awesome. You got it done, you know, fairly quickly. I had, I had, a, I had an employee back then because I was uh, studying, you know, going to, going to college or going to university half uh, part time. And uh, the first time the customer said was like, is this a franchise? Wow. And I was like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, no, it's not, you know, but I was so happy. I was like, man, this is awesome. Yes. Uh, that must have made your day. Yeah, it did. It really did. I was like, I think we've, you know, we fairly nailed that. And uh, let me kind of keep moving, right? Um, and then we started working on sites and so forth. And it, it kind of trans, it kind of transitioned over, right? Uh, more into my, uh, I just had a desire for marketing. Um, over time, you know, we we got into more shops. We got into distribution a little bit. We had something called STS Parts. Uh, back in, you know, a few years ago, we got heavily uh, involved in refurbishing and uh, selling training, selling machinery for the industry. Um, after that, it was uh, a time to kind of like uh, re rethink life. And uh, uh, when I, when SCS Parts shut down, I decided to kind of take a, a year basically off. Uh, of the, I don't know what I'm going to do. So I went back to one of the shops and started working off of there. Um, for a little bit, I got into um, into selling of devices. And, uh, but always my, my, my interest was the marketing, right? How do I make this look fairly nice? How do I, uh, how do I grow a brand, right? And I think that's something that uh, we've been fairly successful at just, uh, names such as STS parts, such as the device connection, uh, even though they were, you know, in and out of the market for different reasons, uh, they were well branded. And there was always that trust behind the brand. Um, and so now after that, I had the opportunity to help uh, Mobile Centrics with marketing. Um, and I was there for a year and a half, right? Um, and we, I, I think we we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a little bit, but I was able to uh, be part of a team and it was super fun. Uh, always, you know, kind of like going heavily on, on marketing. Uh, I have uh, certain, you know, business. In that year of, of the break, I was able to uh, work on the business side a little more. And throughout uh, the years after my first job, I was heavily uh, mentored just by very good business people. So we we just kind of, uh, it was a very cool combination to kind of see a float, right? Like oh, uh, like the engineering background that I had with uh, the business life. I took uh, 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 an entrepreneurship certificate at Harvard, which was super fun. Um, and just kind of moved towards that business marketing side. Um, and I think that's kind of what helped me um, to, to, to grow, right? Um, <clears throat> so all of that together is what's uh, come out in the last brand that we're building called Ad Central. And, uh, you know, uh, being a shop owner, uh, having uh, right now, we're about 16, 17 repair shops. Uh, our marketing is fairly automated. Um, and we, we've been thinking, you know, how uh, one of the one of the big things when you get into marketing is that you notice that it's expensive. Marketing is super expensive, right? Um, you have. <laughs> I started with a designer, and then you're like, man, uh, you're kind of limited, right? You cannot do illustrations, you cannot do video, and then you you need to start thinking about like who's gonna be the creative mind behind it because you might not have the time of the world to sit down and create uh, uh, all this marketing material, uh, and then you need a copy. Uh, 
copy check guy, right? And you, so when you build a marketing team, it's just fairly, fairly a big task. Uh, and then you get into website design and then you get into SEO and then you get into uh, all these digital stuff, right? That make uh, shops grow. And uh, so at Central is thought on how can we automate marketing from uh, thinking as a repair shop being affordable. Um, so the first thing we're doing is we're automating in-store videos and we are doing that through an app. And uh, our app is on Apple TV, Android TV, and soon to be on Fire TV. Um, and the idea is that repair shop owners can come in, basically download the app, sign up, and then just click on general categories of products and services they want to promote, such as iPhone repair, iPad repair, Android repair, drone repair, right? We understand that each shop is very different and each shop has its uh, own pros and cons, right? So uh, people have reached out to me after signing up and said, hey man, can you add security cameras uh, kind of videos? And I was like, well, yeah, I mean, I forgot about that, right? Like I don't do security cameras, but there are so many shops that do. So at Central will allow you to basically pick and choose what products and services you want to promote. So once you do that, um, you go into the Apple TV app and you just click play and all these videos start streaming right away with your logo on them. Uh, and the idea is that we personalize that experience in the upcoming weeks, in the upcoming months. How can we make that TV uh, upsell for you, grow your brand, right? Because when people come in, I, I wish I had Ad Central when I was in my first shop that people would come in and look at those like amazing videos with my logo on them. I'm sure they would have asked, man, are you a franchise? You know? <laughs> uh, so that's kind of like uh, where we're taking at central. We have uh, a few surprises coming in that uh, everything basically involving TV. Uh, uh, how can we make TVs work for you in the shop for, uh, for an affordable price, right? Uh, when you compare these videos to how do I make one of these? You know, usually people are not very well grounded on how much a video is. Um, you know, but in the in the U.S., about the cheapest that you can get a video is between sixty eighty dollars. I mean, th this is like the cheapest that I think that you can find it on Fiverr. And you don't know about quality. You have to give them all the materials. You kind of have to like be the producer, right? Like be behind the scenes, moving, changing, and picking songs. So after $80, you know, worth of uh, paying you someone communicating through all your time and maybe just receiving one video, you know, uh, at Central packs it up into $55 a month, right? And you have access to all our videos with different products and services you can offer. You can contact us, you can reach out to me directly and uh, I can, uh, uh, I'll add videos specifically for your needs. Um, <clears throat> so, that's how we're help, that's how I am helping repair shops now, right? How can we automate the marketing? How can we make them grow their brand? Uh, because I think the brand is very powerful uh, at the end of the day. Sounds like it's a pretty interesting concept for a business for repair shops because uh, not a lot of people, I believe, would have that much knowledge or know where to start with marketing. And because the market has evolved uh, so much in the past few years, we went from banner ads to video ads to all sorts of things now. And uh, it's good that you have a platform that's doing that right now. I want to be able to ask, how did you get to this point where you felt like this is what you wanted to do? And because this is very disruptive and not something that the repair shop industry has seen before. Uh, what made you decide that you wanted to be able to custom build a platform for videos and take it forward from there? Um, I think that uh, everything's, I think everything started, um, I, I think that, that I've summarized my, you know, my, my last 10 years in 10 minutes, but uh, it's been, it's been a whole journey, right? Of just learning marketing and working for different companies, small and big companies uh, doing their marketing. Um, and I own a little franchise uh, in, in Mexico, and I see that this is an issue, right? Marketing is just an issue. Like you said, it has evolved so much. Um, back when I opened my shop, 
I remember that I used to sit down with a radio station person, right? Going through what ads I'm going to run, uh, listening to the ads to see what I want, what kind of voice I want, and how we're going to do a call to, to action. <clears throat> and now it's just completely digital. You know, I think radio stations are great, but they are expensive for a repair shop. You know, when, when you think about a, a radio station or a TV station, a, a local um, station, uh, it's just not going to be very, uh, very immediate, right? You have ATL, you have BTL uh, kind of marketing. So what basically has worked well for the repair shops is that ads, right? Calls to action where you can invest money, you get your money back, and then you can repeat it over and over, right? Um, and I think that um, what what pushed me was I need to be able to create automation, right? We, we, we've seen that that's really where, that's really how it works. Uh, if you cannot automate something in your business, being a repair shop owner, um, then you know that growth is going to be limited. Um, and I think that that happens anywhere. I mean, when you start your repair shop, you think, man, I'm gonna start this repair shop and it's gonna be different, right? I'm gonna be able to help customers right away. And I wanna pick up all my phone calls because I hate when I call someone and they don't pick up the phone. And then I hate when people are not following up with me. I hate, when, you know, you, you kind of think about all these like bad businesses in your mind. Uh, and then you open your repair shop and everything is kosher because you don't have any customers, right? But then customers start walking in, you know, and then you have two, three customers a day and everything is great. You're like, I am making it, you know? It's starting to roll and I'm on top of it. People are super happy, reviews are five stars, you know? But what happens when you get to your 15th store? What happens when you get to your 16th store? If, you know, you don't have time. You don't have time to like have that personal connection with each one of them. So you kind of have to convert everything into metrics, right? Which I'm, you know, you guys are super well-rounded about this, right? I need to be able to know how many, how many people came into my shop? How many people uh, in, were able to spend my, my ticket uh, uh, target, right? In order for me to hit my, my financial uh, part of the business. I need to be able to know how many people uh, have devices that, that have not been picked up. I need to be able to know what my account receivables are, what are my account payables are, right? And I need to start kind of thinking more on a metric side rather than being worried about it, right? Uh, and the truth is that even with one repair shop, once you're a busy repair shop, you, I mean, in the last, last week, I spent uh, about two hours calling shops. And something that I noticed was they were not, they were not picking up their phones. <laughs> and if you're not picking up your phone as a repair shop, you're, you're losing money, right? And uh, same thing sure. happens with, so this is kind of like the phone call side, right? What happens with your marketing side? You know, if, if you kind of visit different Facebooks or different Instagrams uh, of repair shops, you'll see that there are very few that are consistent. Uh, however, people who are paying for service will be consistent, right? And that's kind of like where automation, that's the next step to automation when you're growing. You're like, I'm going to hire someone to make this happen, right? And you kind of let that happen, right? And you know that it's happening, you know, regularly. You don't have to worry about it. You're just kind of paying for it. Um, and it, I wish that we can think about it and on, on every single level, right? Because you have uh, not only your marketing side, you have your financial side as well, right? How are my financial statements coming my way every week or every month, you know? And if you are a repair shop owner, you, you have certain strengths, right? And uh, unfortunately the, the financial strength is, uh, is very, uh, it's not very common among anyone you know <laughs> not only repair shop owners no, no matter where you're at no many people love sitting down it's and uh, creating a pnl creating a balance sheet right so when you're like no man i'll do it because you know a, a bookkeeper charges x month x, uh dollars uh, an hour whatever i can do it but you don't do it right you, you end up kind of like trying to rush at the end of the year 
uh, filing your taxes, but automation didn't happen. You're not being able to read your financial statements week to week. That is one of the big things if you want to grow, right? Um, and uh, same thing with uh, uh, people are so worried about creating leads or maybe they don't use these words, right? But they're always asking, uh, how can I bring people in my shop, right? What are the best paths? What are, you see these questions over and over and over, especially if you're like in the repair shop groups, right? Uh, and that's creating leads. Now, people are not thinking the creation of a lead is only, it's only part of the job you really have to close that sale, right? You really have to go after it hard. Because I remember when I was a, a very young repair shop and I only had three leads, right? But I would get every single one of them, right? In the door. It didn't matter what I had to do. Like I would follow up constantly, texting, uh, Facebooking, whatever. <clears throat> but now you pay advertising and you can get 200 comments but you might forget to follow up, right? You might not take that as a real lead. You might just be like, ah, I have 200 comments. I'm kind of happy about it. I had my dopamine, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, taste and I'm good. But like, you really have to follow through with this 200 customers if you're gonna be investing that much money, right? Or you can automate that in order to be like, how are these people gonna feel like they're being followed up and they can actually come into my shop because people like that attention. Right. If I were a customer and, it, I, it, you know, you're in the fence of getting a service or not, maybe you will comment on a, on a Facebook post. But if they just kind of reply with the with the price and you kind of go to notifications, read the price, you're like, hey, whatever. But if someone actually follows up correctly. Right. And this is kind of one of the arts of like how to close uh, through digital marketing is uh, then you close every sale, right? And how, if you have to think of yourself as a customer, what, what would happen for someone to close a sale with me when I'm needing a service, but it's not 100% necessary, right? Uh, like a broken screen these days, it's not like 100% necessary. Um, people live with broken screens, right? Uh, the same thing happens when you come into your re retail space. Your retail space usually is not well taken care of. Uh, usually you're not thinking about what, one of the things is that you, you, you have created your lead and when they come into the repair shop, they need to be able, be able to see and believe that you are a shop, right? They need to be able to see you, you, your personal brand. This is something that I, I always say, you have a brand. Either you want to, to think about it or you don't want to think about it. You are your own brand, right? So when people come into your shop, right? And they see, clean floors, clean windows, organized shelves. When you have a TV that is playing very well branded ads with your logo on them, the feel and the perception is just different, right? And I, I see this question all the time on the repair groups as well. Well, when you go into Best Buy, you don't ask for a discount. When you go into this, you don't ask for a discount. You don't ask, you know? But the thing is, uh, when they walk into your repair shop, they might not have that same experience that when they go to Target. They might not have that same experience that when they go into Best Buy. So in order to create that experience, there's an investment that needs to go into it, right? And that is your retail, Absolutely. Floor, retail floor, right? Your retail floor needs to look very good. So if you walk into a repair shop where the retail, the retail space is very good where you have you know at central playing in your tv where you have people with polos and a logo and they can say hi on a very uh well um just automatic way right like i'm gonna you're gonna go ahead and say hi and ask this right say your name and then ask what the service is so when it's like very well automated right that's when automation happens in a business and then you have the freedom to step back, right, and say, one repair shop is just running smoothly. These guys are maybe don't have the same interest than the owner because that's, you know, not very common to find an employee or, or, or you know, a team member that would believe and, and it just kind of like buy it, right? Like it, it, it's hard to find that. But if you don't have it, you'll be able to say, I've trained my staff to be able to not miss 
what I would have done, right? Because usually if you're there, you kind of like want to step in and be like, man, he wasn't friendly enough, you know? Or he's kind of letting that person go. But that can be well balanced with heavy training, right? Uh, where you're taking advantage of all of it. So automation is just kind of like the, the, where I think shops need to go or any business needs to go, right? And that's why we took the task to say, hey, there's nothing that we can, that, that we can actually do right now uh, in order to automate in-store videos unless we build our own platform, right? And the, the platform, uh, it's not like a digital signage app right? Where you have to be thinking about your own uh, pictures, your own videos, what I'm going to play. And then, you know, your whole brand just fell right there. You know, if I walk into a repair shop and I have a Samsung logo showing with a back, with a black background, like that's not going to be very appealing to me, right? It's just, what, I, what are you trying to communicate, right? Now, uh, if you walk into a repair shop and they have these videos uh, playing, I, you know, in my opinion, you know, you're going to be able to upsell. And we've seen this in our shops, right? Because you, your reception uh, person or you, you sometimes don't have enough time to be telling about, hey, do you know that we repair laptops? Hey, do you know we repair drones? Hey, do you know that cleaning for your phone? Like, customers are going to be like, stop. Like, I just want this repaired. Right? But if you have that well-branded retail store, and then they're just looking up while you're doing the check-in and they are seeing all these services and they're all like learning about different things, right? You are inviting that person to come back in without you having to sell them, right? And that's the whole reason behind App Central. And at the end of the day, what we want is just growing your brand. Every time you see App Central, hopefully you will be thinking, man, are my floors clean? man, is my shop organized? You know, like it is a brand that you have and you need to take care of it, right? Especially nowadays where competition is hard, where customers expect more, right? It's not like people are coming into the mom and pop shops uh, and, and, and not looking for, for the same experience uh, they have when they go to Apple, right? They want the same experience. And if they don't, they won't be as happy. Yeah, and that's where the disconnect is because, you know, Apple has all this uh, all this focus on marketing. They have a giant budget to be able to present their brand in a certain way. Mom and pop shops, they can't afford that. It's a really tall order for them to be able to represent them the way that Apple does, which is a huge conglomerate. But the thing is that with what you've just told me, the way that your company is working at Ad Central, it cuts down on that quite a lot. Because it builds that sort of brand portfolio, that brand image. Now, if anyone walks into a shop where you know they have branded content from Ad Central playing, which is very nice, very crisp, hits the mark. Uh, it also goes hand in hand with what a brand really is. A brand has its own identity. It has its own life. It's not directly associated with the person who created it or the team that's managing it. It has its own way of representing people. And the number one thing that you need to do with a brand is that it needs to be memorable. When someone walks into your shop, it doesn't matter how many other repair shops have been down the line, how much competition is there. If you've made an impression of them, if they walk out and they remember something from your shop, you've already made that sale. You've already gotten into their mind and they will definitely come back to you because that's what it is. That's exactly the thing that you mentioned right now is that you don't want a Samsung logo on a big screen showing. You want your own logo. You want them to walk out of that store not thinking that they had a Samsung TV. They want their they want to remember your brand. That's what Ad Central is doing, and that's what repair shops in general should be doing. And automation, I believe, also helps cut down on the big chunk of marketing that they feel that they need to do. Like you just mentioned, that you know, there's a lot of things that need to be done. Uh you started off with a graphic designer and then you had people who needed to write copy. You had people who were supposed to work on video. And naturally, a brand also requires a lot of moving hands to be able to manage. But if you can automate a major chunk of that, then it's a major load off. You're able to streamline your processes, focus on the important things that will definitely help you grow. Make that whole marketing exercise easier. And that, I believe, is a great thing for repair shops who don't normally have a lot of time on their hands. Because they're taking people in for repairs 
Uh, they're dealing with customers on the reception. They have devices to fix. They have people to contact and to send out. And they also need to make their sales pitches. So anything, anything in that respect that helps automate helps immensely. Yeah, 100%. And I think now, you know, once sometimes people see at Central and they go, well, I have something on my TV. And I, I used to have something on my TV too, right? I, I had some pictures kind of going. But to be honest, they were not updated uh, maybe every few years, right? When you think about it. So now that you see at Central, you think about it, right? You'll be like, oh man, I can definitely do something. Oh, let me update those pictures. But is that really going to happen every few years? Like, let us do it month to month, right? Let us let that automation happen. And, uh, and I think that's where it's hard, right? Like, I mean, you, I'm sure you guys, you know, go through the same deal where people are like, no, I don't need a POS. You know, we can, we can make it happen with Square. But when they see the full automation, it's just, it's just a different experience, right? It's just like, it allows you to grow. Absolutely. It's all about providing those conveniences to people, uh, making sure they save their time so that they can get more done. And the ultimate goal is basically that they don't have a worry and they can just put their feet up and relax and say, all right, I know things are being taken care of. And that's when they can decide to grow their business. That's when they can give more time to grow their business. So I believe that that's how it's worked for you and your repair shops as well. 100%. I mean, there, there's no way we could, you know, help manage 16 stores without automation in place, right? Um, so I think that's uh, that's kind of one of the, the fun things. You know, we're opening a repair shop in the upcoming, another repair shop in the upcoming weeks. And I can tell you that everything has been fairly automated to where I'm not concerned about what kind of floors we're going to put in or what the what the retail space is going to look at, right? It's, it's there, right? It's, it's automated. We know who's going to do everything and we can kind of run with it, right? So yeah, 100%. Automation is, is where to go. That's really great to hear that, you know, you have a new repair shop that's opening and you already have everything settled. So that's amazing. Let's, uh, let's move forward with uh, some of the things that we have on the docket. So what are some of the things that you learned about repair shop management during your time at Bubble Centrix, particularly as the chief administrative officer? Um, I think Mobile Centrix, uh, you know, speaking of automation, <laughs> I think Mobile Centrix has done an amazing job with automation, right? If you think of Mobile Centrix, uh, you obviously never, uh, you're never asked uh, or you, 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 you never doubt that your order is going to get there, right? You go to the website, you place an order, and you know that unless uh, FedEx messes up, your box is going to be there the next day, right? And I think that's a, a very good lesson to learn um, being a repair shop owner is how does Mobile Centrix make this happen every time, right? Um, and uh, Mobile Centrix is it's just a great example in our industry, uh, but it's, it's the, the mark that you want to hit if you want to be big, right? Uh, if you call Mobile Centrix, they are going to pick up the phone. If you chat, they are going to reply. If you order something and it's in stock, you will get it. And in the few rare cases where something goes out of place, there's also that, uh, that process in place, right? So if there's a part that for some reason stock was you know, bad or something happened to it and you don't have it, do get an email saying part missing, refund apply immediately. Uh, it's just very automatic, right? Uh, so as my time as, uh, you know, CIO at Mobile Centrix, uh, one of the things that I learned about uh, the leadership, you know, about Watkins is uh, he is really good at automation. And to be good at automation, uh, you need to be able to train your staff very well. And you also need to be uh, very well motivated to spend money <laughs> right um, because automation doesn't happen for free um and uh, uh I, and you you know so i don't i don't want to go too deep into it but you know you were you, if you um 
think about what mobile centrics can give you uh, an amazing quality for an amazing price is because automation, <laughs> you know, All right. what other uh, companies do in order to have some processes in place, uh, mobile centrics has figured out a way on how to automate it. Um, and that's, that's why you get such a, you know, good deal when you're buying from them. And, and that's why they are very well known in the industry at the end of the day. Um, in mobile centrics, I mean, you know, they have the best interest of the repair shop at, at heart. Um, and I think that's why, you know, the, the uh, Wacus, uh, the leadership team has, um, has had a very good sync, uh, you know, with, uh, or uh, we have had a good sync just because we are thinking constantly, you know, what the repair shop needs. And if you've ever met one of the guys, uh, you'll know right away that quality is very important, right? Customer service is important. That's kind of what drives it. And uh, that's branding, right? Um, and, uh, you know, when I went into mobile centrics, I helped a lot with branding a lot with processes uh, uh you know i'm very well uh I, i'm i want to make processes happen if you know something about me is that i'm a stickler for just processes overall in in my life and at work and wherever i go it's just kind of one of the things that i do right uh, I, i'm 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 uh, I wake up at the same time every morning and I go running and you know if you wanted to if you wanted to put a bullet in me you'll know what time I'm going to go running by this week on Wednesdays you know <laughs> so that's kind of bad <laughs> but uh, well maybe maybe you can vary up your schedule that day yeah maybe I need, yeah <laughs> but uh, it, it's one of the one of the things right like how can we uh, make a process out of this so that way we don't have to do Right. And that's entrepreneurship at the end of the day. The, the way you scale is you figure out something, you figure out a need and you cover it with a process so that way you can kind of move to the next thing. If you stay in the process, then you're stuck in the process. Um, so that's, you know, one of the things that I've learned is that you see you, you interact with a lot of shops uh, at Mobile Centrics and you see a uh, difference very easily between a healthy repair shop and not a healthy repair shop, right? And then you also see the difference between a shop that is run by a business guy and a shop that is uh, run by the business owner. And I, I don't think that there's necessarily a good and bad, right? It's just kind of like the difference of it. Some people thrive, they want to repair devices and that's fine, right? I, I think that's, I mean, people who are dedicated to the repair life is just excellent. Uh, and you also have people who are uh, who, who thrive by growing, right? And and it, it 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 is everything going back to the same thing of your brand, right? Your brand is what's going to be uh, dictating your shop, right? If you are passionate about repairs, man, I want to send my phone to you because I know that no one else is going to repair it better than you, right? And if you're a if you're a business driven, right, then your priorities are going to be a little different. You, you want more, uh, you, you just have different objectives. Uh, but anyways, that, that, you know, the mobile centric experience was fantastic. We have a great relationship. Um, and uh, I, you know, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to sound too, you know, like I'm, I'm being unfair to other companies, but the truth is that uh, mobile centric is just excellent. So, you know, if you haven't tried it, try it. Um, and uh, they obviously work, you know, very closely with us as well. Uh, and then you will find mobile centric brands in that central. So I think that, you know, being one of the people who was a part of the organization gave you a lot of insight into how they work and, you know, what their operating procedures are. Like you said, you know, you saw different people running their repair shop in different styles. And, you know, it was it was a very vast sort of experience. How do you feel as uh, a person who's been on the inside dealing with all these people, um, seeing how mobile centric sort of like took them along and, you know, build a relationship? I think that 
we can relate that to the brand, right? Um, if you know Wacom's, you know, Saab, you know, leadership, leadership team, and you interact with, you know, Musa, or you interact with Fahim and all these guys, uh, you, you see the bread and butter of mobile centrics. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you think of mobile centrics as a brand, it needs to be backed up by people who are branded the same way, basically. Um, so, you know, being there, uh, it, it, you, you see how mobile centrics has helped the shops uh, in the sense of uh, helping with certain processes that would be kind of, it would be harder if you don't, right? So one of the best examples uh, that I can think of right now, off the top of my head is uh, LCD buyback. Um, when LCD buyback started, um, you know, you would have people coming to your repair shop and kind of test it, uh, test your screens. And I remember, um, I mean, man, I think at one point I had about 30, 40 boxes worth of broken screens and no one was doing anything with them, right? I mean, I would kind of wait for someone to come and test, but these guys, it's not like they didn't have automation in place, right? They, they would come sometimes every month, sometimes every six months, sometimes every, you know. So if you think of mobile centrics when you're creating an LCD buyback, you know, you log in and you can put in any quantity that you'd like uh, as far as uh, screens go. And uh, you literally click on create a label, right? And when you create a label and, you know, you will get asked how many of them. Uh, and then if you have 20 boxes, you click 20 and then click, you know, uh, process request and you'll get an email and then you can print them right away and just stick them to your boxes and have FedEx, you know, pick them up next time the FedEx guy comes or you can drop them off at the end of, you know, when you close your shop. So that's right there an example of how Mobile has helped with automation going beyond their scope, right? Um, and how not only, uh, you know, and this is just kind of like a trend that starts, right? Something starts something and then uh, you'll see it over and over because it, it works. It's, it's a great idea, right? Um, so one of the things that, you know, uh, I, I'm i still uh, running the marketing for them and I go over process and so forth. <clears throat> We're always constantly on thinking, how can we make this more automatic, <laughs> right? How can we make this to where it's so much easier? Uh, so I'm sure that you'll see more things coming up soon. Um, but that's really how, you know, repair shops are helped by this. And you don't notice anymore, right? Uh, but mobile centrics is a way that you're automating your own shop. Um, you are spending money with them, but you're letting them do it. As before, uh, I'm sure you, you remember this, but there would be, <clears throat> uh, you'll be buying either from China directly and you would have to send wires, don't know what happens, don't know what happens to warranties, right? So if you kind of go even a little further back um, with how automate or how, you know, supply chain has to help the repair shop grow is that now you can offer uh, repair next day because you can overnight the part um, and you can help the customer right there. But years ago, right, when back when I started, there was not that. I mean, you would have to order the part from, I mean, eBay was as automatic as it would get, right? Uh, and then you start getting parts straight from China and then you, you type your cash flow. I think people are, you know, if you kind of start thinking about like how uh, uh, supply chain has really helped the industry, you'll notice that it, it has affected your income, right? So if you have your PL, you have income for LCD buybacks, you have a better management of your warranties, you have uh, your cash flow is a lot bigger because you don't have to tie down X amount of money buying from China. Uh, you don't have to worry about people who are trying to make big margins because they only sell <clears throat> one model of screens on eBay. Uh, you know, when you can go to Mobile Centrics and you can essentially buy, um, you know, pretty much any part you want with very thin margins because that's the business, right? Um, and uh, that's, if you think about it, right, it's what you allow uh, for automation to happen. So if you want marketing automation, right, you would, in, in you're confident that uh, when you know me, right, when you know my team, when you know at Central, 
that there's no way that anyone can beat us on marketing if we're dedicated to this, right? And the whole idea behind it is um, we want to make it as cheap as possible for repair shops to be able to have full marketing automation at the end of the day, right? At Central, as you know it today, hopefully it's not what you'll know of it in the next year. Um, so, but you need to let that automation happen and you need to let the marketing automation happen in order for you to grow and not think, what am I posting today? What do I have playing on in my store? You know, what do I, like, you don't have to worry about it. You just need to let it go. <laughs> I think it's a good way to be able to put it because, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff uh, for repair shops, they don't know how to be able to do it. And when they see, you know, the prices that other agencies, et cetera, charge, so that scares them. Making it as affordable as, say, like, you know, how Netflix or Spotify or any other service is doing right now, that makes it a lot more accessible and that makes them more comfortable with working with it because they know that uh, they're paying a certain amount, which is within reason, which is a reasonable amount, and they're getting a service out of it that, you know, that works for them, that's custom tailored to them. Yeah. That, I believe, is a really great way to be able to position your business. And I think App Central, if that's what it's doing, that's amazing. Thanks, so. <laughs> That's great. So I want to come back to a, a thing that you mentioned earlier with regards to routines, where you mentioned that, you know, uh, routines need to be kept updated. Otherwise, you know, you remain stagnant. Uh, you know, you remain in one place. So sometimes repair shops, they sort of get to that stagnant area where they don't, they aren't able to see what the next big step is, how to reach the next level of their growth you know, their growth chart. So how does, you know, what sort of marketing strategies should they implement as a repair shop in order to be able to make that sort of growth? Um, and uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of processes. I'm a fan of automation. I'm a fan of habits, right? Uh, and I think that's kind of like how it starts. It starts with habits and uh, if you are, if you're putting processes in place for your life, you call them habits. And if you uh, make process for your, your business, you call them processes. But it's the same thing. Um, um, I think the best way to start a habit or to start a process is you need triggers. Okay. And this, this is, <laughs> you know, this is uh, one of my passions, but like you need triggers. So one of the things, for example, when, when I talk about running, um, is that I, I don't think that I feel any different than anyone when, when you wake up in the morning as far as like, I don't want to get out of bed kind of thing, right? <laughs> uh, sometimes you, you're running your ideal week where, you know, I'm, I'm going to bed at 8.39, waking up at 3.50 in the morning, but sometimes it doesn't happen, right? You go to bed at 1, 2 in the morning and you still have to wake up early uh, to kind of run your day. And man, you just kind of don't feel about it. So you, and that's when when triggers start. So one of the things that I do is that as soon as I wake up, get out of my bed, right? Brush my teeth, and I I put working uh, I put running clothes and I put my running shoes, right? So I know I'm not gonna go running right away. I'm gonna go ahead and sip on my cup of coffee and I'm gonna check my emails for you know yesterday and so forth. Um, but I am ready to go running, right? So. There's no way I'm going to go and be like, oh, I'm going to change out my clothes and then go to work without running. Like, I know I have to go, right? And when I start looking at my, at my, at my clock, I'm like, man, I'm getting close to that mark where I have to go, right? Like, if I don't go now, I'm not going to go. So I, you know, close my laptop and go running. So same thing with your business. Uh, you need to be able to have triggers, right? Maybe in a personal life, it's triggers and uh, on the business life is schedules, right? So you have something like Mondays, I'm going to send my LCD buybacks. Tuesday, I'm going to check on how many uh, devices I have sitting on my shelf uh, that I need to call people, right? And maybe if I notice that I have 40 devices, right? And I'm going to tell you this, if people are listening to this and I will not be... Uh, impressed if people have over a hundred devices if they don't have a process in place that have been sitting there from customers right but one of the keys for a healthy repair shop is that you cannot allow five of them right so when you have you know when you have 
five devices sitting for over four days after repair, that should be a fairly yellow red flag where you're like, I need to start calling my customers, right? So you need to pro put a process in place for you to be able to be able to say, hey, you know, if a device stays repaired, right, uh, as ready on, in my repair shop for four days, this is a red flag for my manager. My, my manager mm -hmm. needs to call me two, three times a day in order for this device to be picked up, right? And it might seem like a lot, but at the same time, it is a service, right? Because uh, if I think about this, if I, if I take my phone, I'm gonna go and pick it up right away, right? Because it's my phone. But if it's my kid's iPad, man, I'm not gonna go get it until my next trip, right? Until my kid is just <laughs> But if someone is calling me two, three times a day, right? I'm gonna not pick up, but they, I cannot get it on my head, right? So I'm gonna be like, dude, I'm just gonna come get it. Like, stop bothering me, right? I would come get it, right? And your p is gonna be healthy. And then that guy is gonna be happy because he didn't lose an iPad at the end of the day, right? You made him go. So at the end of the day, people need help sometimes, right? And this is just kind of like an example of how this can happen. Um, so the, the best thing is uh, to be able to sit down and say, hey, what am I, you know, what are the things that I need to do, right? Uh, I need to do, I need to send buybacks. I need to send warranties in. I need to check on how many devices I have uh, sitting on my store uh, that I just need to be realistic about, right? Like, is it going to be repaired or not, you know? Uh, and if not, even if it's not, like, just call them, right? And if it, they are repaired, like, you have a bigger uh, motivation to go after that call in order to get some more money, right? Um, and then you need to start thinking, okay, you know, once a month, I'm going to go and check all my expenses. And, uh, you know, this happens, on, you know, in my personal life or my business life. I go through my transactions, right? And make sure that I don't have any trash transactions. And sometimes I buy something that I'm like, I don't need it, right? I'm, not, I'm just gonna take it back. Like, why am I gonna like, even if it's $10, right? Or five bucks, like whatever it is, it's just, it's trash. If, I'm, if it's gonna end in the trash, I'd rather have five dollars back, right? Same thing in the repair shop. So the idea of, a, of how to run a repair shop is just to think about all these lists and then, have it on, uh, you know, for me, it works on my calendar, right? If I put it on my calendar, it happens. And I kind of joke about it, you know, in the office where someone is asking me something and I go, if you want it to happen, you know, just put it on my calendar, you know? <laughs> and uh, it, it, it's been uh, funny enough to where, you know, uh, people put things, you know, that I, I kind of laugh about sometimes, right? Like, uh, uh, like I said that I was gonna buy a cup of coffee for someone and they'll put it in my calendar and send me an invite, buy coffee for so-and-so, right? <laughs> and they know <laughs> if it's on my calendar, it happens, you know? So I will do it, right? I, and that's my 15 minutes blockage to go and go to starbucks.com and send them a coffee. So, you know, uh, in your repair shop, you kind of have to do the same thing, right? Just have a calendar and stick to it. It doesn't matter what happens, you need to stick to it. Like, and if you said Monday, you're gonna do it, you don't go to bed until you do it, right? You know, if you say you're going to send something. So, you know, that's kind of how processes work, at least for us. And that's how we've seen that they've been fairly successful, you know, in order for us to be able to run things without uh, me having to go in, right? And I think that's, uh, when that happens, then we know that a process is bad, right? I can imagine that would be a really great way to build your processes. And, you know, it, it's all about the sort of like um, the mental preparation that you have, the sort of discipline and, you know, the sort of consistency that you have, um, the, um, the diligence with which you operate, because you know that this is a task that needs to be done. Uh, you put it on the calendar, like you mentioned, and if it's on the calendar, it needs to be done. So that's how you make that progress, where um, if in the future you hope to achieve something, let's say three weeks down the line, Start put, you know, dividing it up, chunking it up, and putting it on the calendar so that you can work your way towards it. A lot of the times, I believe, um, it's not just in repair business. It's in general, in all sorts of business, in all sorts of professions, where you're not able to see what happens um, six months down the line or three months down the line. You're focused on the here and now. You're focused on the immediate project. But you have to realize that that immediate project is building towards something it ultimately feeds into this big um, 
this big ambition, this big uh, idea, this target that you've set for yourself. And you need to be able to position that project and see it to completion, put it on the calendar and make sure it's done so that you can reach that goal, that objective that you set for yourself. And that's how I believe growth would work in a lot of cases. And I hope that's how it does work for repair shops. As a repair industry uh, veteran, as a person who's owned repair shops, I'm sure you can attest to that. Yeah, yeah. And I think that, uh, you know, something that you said kind of like uh, called my attention, uh, diligence, you know, I don't think diligence, uh, I think diligence is 100% needed, right? But I don't think you, you're born with diligence kind of thing. Like, <laughs> again, like, it's not like people don't want to go running every morning, right? It's not like people don't want to have a healthy repair shop. People do, but like, uh, I think what people don't realize is that uh, you need triggers. And I, I kind of mentioned this with, with running, but like how that works in your repair shop is if you said that Mondays, you're gonna send LCD buybacks, as soon as you walk into your repair shop, what you do, you put all the buybacks in the most annoying place that you can find. If that's your counter, it is your counter, right? So Mondays I go in and every, in, all that I have to do is go to my LCD buyback basket and put it on my counter because throughout the day, I'm gonna be looking at that, right? And until I don't get rid of it, I don't put it down. So it's not like I'm gonna put it back down and be like, hey, put it back there, no. It's gonna stay here until I ship this thing, right? And then same thing with your devices that you have to call people, right? So you said Wednesdays, Wednesday you walk into your repair shop and you pull all these devices and put them on your counter, right? Don't do anything else. Like, and then maybe people start coming in and then you start kind of getting rid of it, right? So you start like that. And then at the end of the day, next Monday, you'll see that it's still gonna sit in your counter for eight hours. It's gonna sit six hours and then four and then two. And then it's gonna be immediate. Like you're like, I'm going to put it in and I'm going to put up boxes and I'm going to print it because it's just easier to get rid of it, right? And that's kind of how you get started, right? And uh, like you said, another thing that I like what you said was um, uh, when you account for a three-month uh, worth of work on, on this sense, you'll see that it's, it's massive, right? Uh, you'll see that you've made a difference. Maybe one little thing one day is going to change things. But when you see it over the course of three months, then it just adds up, right? And that's kind of how things have to work in order for you to hit goals, in order for you to grow your shop, right? It's not gonna happen overnight. There's no way it's gonna happen overnight. So your, your dose of dopamine is gonna happen with those little tasks, right? Like every day, little tasks, and then eventually, Absolutely. You know, you'll get there. And, the, and that hit of dopamine, when you get those tasks done, oh, it's amazing. Yes, yeah, 100% makes you feel really good once you've had that calendar cleared you know you go at the end of the day and you're like man i did some work today <laughs> yes i i killed it yes yeah that feeling right like that's hard to get but there's nothing like it <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely so uh let's let's move forward so um let's talk about the the sort of business model that repair shops have how do you feel about the current uh, business model that they have in place. Do you think it is adequate for this sort of environment that we're in right now? And if not, what sort of change do you think needs to be brought in to make it better? Um, I think uh, industry predictions are obviously predictions, right? Uh, one of the things that I, I'd say is always look at big businesses, right? Um, when you think of a big business, uh, you will encounter that they're, they have automated a way to make predictions, right? They kind of see where the market is shifting because they have teams dedicated to this and they are investing tons of money trying to see what works and what doesn't work. Um, so I think that in our industry, uh, if we look at, you know, the bigger guys, um, we are looking at an industry that is decentralizing, right? If you kind of think about uh, of how repair used to happen uh, back in the day from the big guys is that in order for you, well, you know, at, at one point you would have to take your device to one warranty center, right? That you would have. And, 
it might not be in every city. You might, you know, before you would have to ship it somewhere. Uh, and then you started seeing how repair shops, you know, took uh, a, a toll in the market uh, and took market away from the big guys, right? Because they would have more of a decentralized, meaning uh, people can reach uh, them easily. And uh, especially when phones became so needed, um, you need to uh, go in and out kind of thing. Um, so what we've, we're seeing now, right, is that now you can take your, your device to all of these places that uh, people are caring about being closer to the consumer, right? So this is working very well. Um, I think that we also see how online shopping is growing fairly fast. Um, <clears throat> so if I had to make a prediction uh, out of the industry is that it's going to continue that way. Um, I think the next thing is that we have to figure out how to do repairs uh, being more mobile, right? Uh, and what does that exactly mean? I think that there's a lot of testing that needs, needs to happen. Uh, I think that uh, we see how going to the consumer might be uh, might be a good idea now. It, you know, I remember trying that uh, back in the day, and it wasn't as great. Like people were not as comfortable. Maybe you know, have someone come in, but people have getting have gotten busier now. Um, and uh, I think that that's one of the models that we'll see grow, right? And it might not be exactly what we have in mind at this point, but we need to figure out how can I get to them. And what is, what, why would they not want me there? Um, and try to like come into that, you know, uh, how are you gonna cover that need for the market at the end of the day? Um, so I think that repair is decentralizing for, um, from shops or from, you know, like we have to go more into the consumer or we have to make that fairly immediate for the consumer uh, in order for the phone to be repaired. Because if you think about your day, I think about my day, and I can tell you that the, the uh, you know, I needed a replacement for an Apple TV remote. And I literally have an Apple uh, store, um, I would say 300 feet from my office. Okay, I mean, fairly close. I, I can walk to it in two minutes. And it happened two or three weeks and I did not go. Right, I did not go because we are busy. I mean, I go in, I have calls, I have this, and then I have to be out, I have to go back home, right? I ended up having to order this from Amazon <laughs> through Apple, right? <laughs> so <laughs> you think about it and you're like, man, people, if I'm having issues with this, imagine if my phone was broken, right? I remember when I, I broke my phone one day, right? And I was like, I know how to repair it myself, but I don't even, have time to open this thing, right? So it, it's just one of those things, right? Where automation needs to happen more. And how do we cover that need of the, of the consumer? Because people are not even going to the grocery store anymore. People are just buying online, right? People buy toilet paper, uh, you know, on, the, uh, on Amazon. So I think that's, that's the next thing that we need to figure out as repair shop owners. I think it has a lot more to do with uh, the idea of convenience because ever since Amazon sort of like took over a couple of years ago and online shopping became the norm and especially now since last year, uh, it's the one year since uh, we've all been facing COVID-19. But uh, ever since then, we've seen a lot more reliance on people staying in, not having to do the legwork and the convenience of everything that they need coming to their doorstep so that they have more time to be able to do all this other stuff. Like the thing that you mentioned just now, you have an Apple store that's 300 feet from your door, right? And getting an Apple TV remote is, you know, just a matter of getting up and going there, but you know the sort of time that that'll take, the sort of things that it'll put you away from. Your time is better used here. And so it would be more convenient that you would be focusing on that while someone from Amazon comes to your door, rings your bell and says, here you go, this is the remote you've been, well, you've been ordering. Oh, 100%. And I, I don't know. Also, I think it also has to do with uh, personality, right? Um, I'm, 
uh, maybe I don't look like it, but I'm a big introvert. Um, so I'd rather not to talk to people, right? Like, <laughs> and uh, when I go, you know, when I'm riding an Uber, I like for the Uber to not talk to me. Like I, I feel comfortable not talking, right? Um, Trust me, the feeling is mutual. <laughs> and I believe after this, everyone has become an introvert. <laughs> <laughs> so going to the Apple store is like, man, I'm gonna have to talk to the guy. And then, you know, Amazon just leaves, leaves a box there for me. I don't have to like <laughs> say anything. <laughs> feels odd it feels um it feels weird especially in the situation that we're in because uh, you know the sort of human connection the sort of element of talking to people has become a lot more cumbersome but uh at the same time you know it's the whole fact of that you know it's a service that you're being provided and you know you just don't want to be able to deal with people sometimes you just want things to come to you and not take that hassle yeah. so it's the idea of convenience and uh, you know i think uh i think repair shops they uh, working along this sort of business model would actually benefit them quite a lot. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's about like not wanting to interact with people that you're not, you know, familiar with, I guess. So, uh, you know, I think th that's, uh, that's a very good point. Like how can a uh, repair shop owners, you know, how can we move the industry towards giving that person an option, right? Not to have to talk to people if they don't want to, they might not feel comfortable with it. That's true. That's absolutely true. So, uh, now that we've talked a more, more about where the industry can go, let's talk about what happens when someone gets there. So if a person, uh, if a repair shop owner builds up their business, uh, they have this ambition to open like four stores by the end of the year and they get there. Uh, so, you know, that might be, you know, scaling up too fast. How will they be able to sort of like maintain that stride and sustain that business? When all of a sudden, you know, they've just shot to the top. They've got like, you know, six doors and, you know, starting from two, they went to six. How do they maintain that uh, stability and that uh, uh, scalability and stay afloat? Man, I think that, uh, I mean, my answer is going to be the same than before. It's automation, right? Uh, the only way to be able to have multiple repair shops without you having to go crazy <laughs> is you have to have systems in place you need to have processes in place and uh, i think when you multi uh, when you have multiple stores uh there are obviously several concerns right one, one of them is customer service um uh, another one would be money right it's money tight it's money not tight and uh, this is something that um, it never goes away, right? Uh, as far as like you concerned about it. Um, but uh, as you're growing, you just need to be able to, to make sure that you have metrics in place, right? So as far as, far as uh, financial, uh, the, aspect, the financial aspect goes, uh, this is something that uh, it's heavily, uh, monitor daily i mean you know and if you if you are and you know i talked to i talk about this with our franchisees and i remember the first time i told them like hey man you guys need to uh, start sending uh, because we saw a lack of financial strength right um we started working towards we need to work on a weekly financial statement um uh, that you can deliver not so much for us but for accountability, right? And uh, some people were going kind of crazy about it. And they were like, what, like weekly? How do you even make a p &L weekly? You cannot do it, like, you know. But uh, as you know, more business people, a week is even too much sometimes, right? So you have to do it daily. You have to check, especially when you have multiple stores that you're not in, you have to check those daily because a day, right? It's a lot of money when you multiply times the amount of shops that you have, right? So it's not the same thing to not hitting your goal in a shop for a thousand dollars, which is still bad, right? But when you have, you know, 10 shops, 10K that you lost in a day. So you need to be able to check why, right? And you need to be able to see if it's something that, you know, like sometimes, I mean, you know, having shops um, not in the same town, you forget about certain things, right? So when we see a shop that kind of goes down, 
for a day, you know, you're like, what happened there? Like, you, you know, you, and you call the manager and the manager goes like, you know, uh, there was uh, a thunderstorm yesterday. You're like, okay, well, all right. You know, you, you start like noticing things that, you know, you should, you wouldn't, right? Um, but now then you have other places where it's like, oh, you know, uh, the orders are behind. Like we didn't get, or, you know, uh, you guys forgot to place the order or, you know, uh, and, and then you're like, well, if, if it's something that, I, that happened because of us, we need to fix it right away. Why did that happen? You, you know, you start going down this trail, uh, but you cannot be calling uh, X amount of managers every day trying to find out what's going on. You, you go through metrics, right? So if our ARs, our account receivables are high at the, you know, uh, when, when we go through this, then, you know, I see why, why is this high? Like, are you not making calls or, uh, you know, what's going on, right? So uh, everything kind of goes through metrics instead of you trying to go through uh, living everything because that's going to be fairly impossible um, in my opinion, right? So the way you can stay afloat is you need to have metrics in place. Uh, from how how do you know your store is clean? How do you know how do you know that it smells good? That's something crazy. Like we monitor, like you know, through a budget of uh, of cleaning, uh, you know, we know if uh, we we have a fairly good idea if the shop is well taken care of or not. So you know, if you know the the percentage drops on expenses for that month on the cleaning supplies most likely the repair shop is not going to be clean, right? So it, we, we've gotten very good at the metrics um, where we know like where, what can be happening. Um, and, uh, and that's kind of how we monitor shops now. It's very interesting to know that, you know, even cleaning has its own set of metrics that you need to be looking into. And I, I really hope, you know, the shop smells great. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, yeah, but that is really nice to be able to know that, you know, a lot of these things are broken down into metrics and, you know, the, it's through that that you can see how well something is doing now. And, you know, if my knowledge is correct, a lot of services now give you those sort of metrics. Uh, a lot of premium services, you know, they let you know what, uh, you know, what sort of figures you're working with, what your daily takes are, and how you, you can use those to be able to chart growth and sustainability in your business. So, and you know, that's the whole point of a business analyst or a business intelligence person that they look at that information and they tell you, all right, this is what is needed. This is how we forecast our growth. And this is the trajectory in which we should be heading. Yeah. And then you have, uh, I mean, uh, same thing for marketing, right? Um, so one of the things that we always uh, go over, um, uh, is marketing related to income. Uh, and one of the things that we've noticed, even on our small sampling of 16 stores, is that we have, we know like how much you're supposed to be spending, right? And you see shops who are spending it and shops who are not, right? And it's always hard, uh, you know, to be able to do this because it's easy to throw money at something without being smart, right? So it's, it's a combination of like, you have to invest the money, but you have to be able smart on where to invest the money, right? And how do you divide it? ETL, ATL, in retail, out of retail, right? Um, so, so yeah, but metrics, I think it would be the answer to this. Metrics, you know, I'm a big believer in them as well. Um, the podcast that we're listening to, I, you know, rigorously look at the metrics and I'm really happy every time it goes up. <laughs> so I know how that feels. <laughs> right. Okay. So I think we're running up to uh, the, the last leg over here. Uh, so let's go over it. So, uh, let's talk more about you as a person who's been in the repair industry. So with all this knowledge and all this experience and all this time that you've spent in, uh, what sort of transformation have you seen yourself as a person, uh, you know, in as a person? And uh, how has the repair industry affected your personal life? And how do you think it's affected the lives of others within the sphere? Man, this is a very uh, interesting question. I think being uh, in, a, in a repair shop, um, uh, to be honest, it's not something that I that I ever thought about, right? Um, I always uh, I was uh, going for uh, biomedical engineering. I was interning. At a, I was designing internal defibrillators for uh, 
That's very interesting. I interned at different companies that are well known in the environmental industry, and uh, I never thought that I would end in the repair industry. I always thought I'm going to go into the biomedical field, right? I'm going to go ahead and design this, and I really enjoyed it. You know, it was fun while I did it. Um, but going into a repair shop really gave me uh, an insight for small businesses. Uh, and it's something that I thought about when I was interning at, you know, big companies. Um, so being in the repair industry has helped me, uh, I guess, experience that entrepreneurship life um, that, uh, that you kind of, that you need to have a heart for. <laughs> Not anyone can be an entrepreneur because uh, I think that it takes a toll of you, right? It's just in my personal life, uh, you know, we I've had ups and I've had downs, and you know, I've had uh, I don't know what the wor what worse could it be than down, but you know, where you're just like dead on the floor, you cannot move, kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> um, but the repair shop industry has been fantastic as far as teaching me uh, managing resources, um, you know, that being time, money, coming up with metrics in order to be able to survive. Um, and uh, it also has uh, taught me to be more uh, repair conscious, 100%. Uh, meaning, you know, not be so wasteful, being able to say, you know, I can definitely do this, you know, um, if something breaks, just go ahead and kind of get it done. Uh, I love for, for those uh, intricate details uh, that uh, usually, you know, you, you want to think about uh, and how, uh, you know, what happens to batteries <laughs> after they're replaced kind of thing, you know, and how that, like, it, it's a whole industry. Um, so I think in, if I had to summarize, you know, how, like what changes I've undergone, it's just uh, to appreciate uh, the work that everyone does in a repair shop and how unique we are um, and how different personalities, different traits, different skills end up in the same industry where you can tell, um, you know, the difference in shops when you see them. Uh, I think that's been super fun. Uh, you know that when you get to see the owners, right? And you're like, okay, I see what his strength is and it's very cool, you know? Uh, so anyways, I think that would be my answer for that. I believe that, you know, being in this sort of space, it makes you realize all the things that, you know, that you're capable of. Because let's, let's face it, not a lot of people who got into this field thought it was their dream job, you know, they never thought that kids that they would one day open up a repair shop and, you know, get into this line of work. But it show it, it sort of reinforces the fact that yes, you're capable of doing these things that you didn't know and you're able to pull through. You are resourceful, you are um smart, you are uh you have foresight, you have the the you know the knowledge and the awareness you have the mental processes and the physical capabilities to be able to pull off something like this. So it sort of reinforces that confidence in you that, you know, even though it's an, you know, it's a tough, it's a tough act. It's something that might not, uh, you know, that you might not know where it will take you, but you know, for sure that you'll get there. It'll plant your feet on the ground and tell you that, you know, you can stand, you can walk, you can do this. Yeah, 100%. So I'm glad you have that feeling for you. And I'm glad that Ad Central is doing amazingly for itself. So if anyone wants to look for you, where can we find you? So uh, I'm, I'm big on social media. You can, uh, fa you know, you can add me on, on Facebook. You can add me on Instagram as Israel Kintal. Uh, I post tons of stories about uh, my hobbies mostly being running. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and uh, uh, we are at Central and you can find us at join at central.com and we're also on Facebook we're on Instagram um, we have released a 7 free day trial so you can 
go in uh, either, and now we've expanded, so not only to Apple TV, we're on Android TV, uh, and we're also on Fire TV. Uh, so if you want to try us out, you know, just log in fairly, fairly uh, easy, you know, just follow steps and you will have a seven free day trial anyone who tries it for the first time. So join at central.com and Israel Kintal. Israel Kintal at join at central.com. That's what it is. And I hope you had a great time because I know I certainly yeah. did. It, it was really nice. Thank you, man. I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate your time too. Senor Isira Kirtal, muchas gracias. Gracias. See you later, bro. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.